Hello everyone, I'm Jo Ashbourne, the Director of the St Cross Centre for the History and Philosophy of Physics and I'd like to warmly welcome you all to today's special event in association with Oxford's Department of Physics. We have nearly 400 people joining us today from all around the world, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening across the time zones. We're delighted to welcome Dr Jim Green to speak on The Martian, Science Fiction and Science Fact. Jim has been NASA Chief Scientist since 2018 having started working at NASA following the completion of his PhD in 1979. He's held a succession of posts at NASA, including head of the National Space Science Data Center, chief of the Space Science Data Operations Office, and more recently, director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters. But perhaps topping all that, Jim's highest accolade yet just might be that he has an asteroid named after him, 25913 James Green. Jim has kindly agreed to take questions after his lecture, and these can be typed into the Zoom Q&A box. Jim, we're really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Well, Joanne, thank you so very much. Uh, it's really a delight to be here. Uh, and so let me uh, share my screen. What I'd like to do today is give you, as this scene shows, a behind the scenes look at how uh, Ridley Scott and his team uh, worked with NASA to develop the, the movie, The Martian. And indeed, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous movie. We'll show a little clip about it and give you a little background on um, uh, much of what went on uh, in terms of making it as realistic as possible. Of course, The Martian starts from the book by Andy Weir. Uh, this came out uh, on the order of 2012 just as we were landing Curiosity uh, on the surface of, uh, of Mars. It was picked up right away by uh, Fox uh, Studios and they wanted to, to do uh, a movie. The original script was written by Drew Goddard, but Drew got lured away from uh, producing the movie and directing the movie uh, when he decided to do a Marvel movie, which of course uh, uh, always means big money in, in, in Hollywood. Uh, and this is when Ridley Scott actually had an opportunity to start the production and pick up the script. Uh, now, Drew Goddard had always, always, already had promised the role of um, uh, Mark Watney to Matt Damon. And indeed, from what I understand, in talking to Matt and Ridley, after their initial conversation, Ridley said, yes, Matt, we want you to be the Martian. And so what I'd like to do, uh, since the movie came out in 2015, a few years ago, is a play, indeed, a little trailer to get everybody up to speed on what the, mov what the movie is about and some of the exciting scenes that we will pick out and use and talk about uh, the real science of Mars. Every human being has a basic instinct to help each other out. If a hiker gets lost in the mountains, people coordinate a search. If an earthquake levels the city, people all over the world send emergency supplies. This instinct is found in every culture, without exception. At around 4.30 a.m., our satellites detected a storm approaching the Ares 3 mission site on Mars. The storm had escalated to severe, and we had no choice but to abort the mission. But during the evacuation, astronaut Mark Watney was killed. I'm entering this log for the record. This is Mark Watney, and I'm still alive, obviously. I have no way to contact NASA or my crewmates. But even if I could, it would take four years for another manned mission to reach me. And I'm in a hab designed to last 31 days. So, in the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. Okay, let's do the math. I gotta figure out how to grow four years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, none of this matters anyway. 
Houston, be advised. We've got a video message. It's directed to the whole crew. Play it. My God. <laughs> Mark Watney is still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. We left him behind. Let's go get our boy. This is something NASA rejected. So we're talking mutiny. And if we mess up the supply rendezvous, you die. If we mess up the Earth gravity assist, we die. It's space. It doesn't cooperate. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's going to go south on you. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Is it possible that he's still alive? Well, indeed, that was a really exciting overview of the movie. And of course, the movie has uh, plenty of tension based on not, not problems between the characters, but indeed problems with uh, Mark Watney and, and nature. Uh, so when Ridley Scott called NASA headquarters after he had gotten the script and decided um, he needed some expertise about what Mars is really like, uh, they put uh, uh, Ridley in touch with me. Now, I turned out to be the head of planetary science. We had just landed Curiosity on the surface of Mars. And the head of the branch that runs the Mars program, Doug McQuistion, had just retired. And I was acting in that role. And so uh, it fell to me to give Ridley uh, uh, a call and then talk about what he'd like to do. So at that time, I hadn't read The Martian and, and uh, uh, really didn't understand what he was trying to do, except what was coming through loud and clear uh, was that he wanted to make it as realistic as possible. And so at the end of our conversation, it really then meant that we needed to begin the process once we approved our NASA's participation in working with Ridley on the movie. And I became the head consultant to organize that uh, interaction between his team and ours, that we needed to take them on tours of several of the centers. So here are some of the tours. We went to Johnson Space Center to see the Mars mock-ups and vehicles and in and, and many of the control rooms and give them the background, the look and feel for how NASA really does uh, its missions. In fact, um, here is the Human Exploration Research Analog Habitat in the lower uh, left-hand corner. This is actually our, our, our draft or first, if you will, uh, Mars uh, uh, habitat. Uh, so we went on to a tour, took a good look at what's on the inside. Uh, I worked with the art, uh, uh, the major art designer. His name is Art Max. And, and Art was really wonderful to take on these tours. He'd have a camera and take hundreds and hundreds of pictures of everything that he could see. And he would be constantly asking me questions. Well, where is this? Where is that? How do you do this? How do you do that? And there were many of these questions we hadn't even thought of or we hadn't designed anything yet. And I finally got to the point of saying, Art, look, you're moving ahead. You're making things happen that, that need to happen for the movie that we haven't figured out yet or what we were going to do. Please use your creativity. Design your sets the way you think they need to be in terms of the ergonomics and everything else about it. And we'll not only enjoy it, but we might even adapt some of those designs to real spaceflight hardware. So we had a really exciting time working with the team on these tours. And of course, as you can see, many of the structures, you know, like the like this entry hall uh, that was used in the movie of the Martian, uh, were were predicated on some of the designs that Art Max saw at Johnson Space Center. Now we also looked at um, the vehicles. You know, NASA has uh, what's called the the uh, multi mission space exploration vehicle. That's shown here on the on the bottom. Uh, right-hand side. Inside that vehicle, you see the, 
the uh, views, you know, little iPad uh, uh, views that are managing a whole variety of uh, functions, all electronic. And then you see in the upper left, the movie version of exactly that vehicle. And here you see indeed uh, the screens and how it's operated. And in fact, it has a beautiful look and feel about it. Uh, you know, little aerodynamic nature there that uh, uh, is really quite a, an artistic flair. So indeed, Art was doing these things uh, and he certainly didn't meet, need me to tell him that, you know, and, and I love the designs that they came up with. And, of course, these are very functional. These are the kind of things that we're going to be using on the surface of Mars. So, indeed, that desire to really create the same look and feel was, um, was very important to them, even down to the spacesuits. And, indeed, uh, at, the, at that time, we were working on what's called a surface suit that was under development. Here is uh, Deva Newman, uh, who designed this suit. She, she turned out to be, uh, 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 just um, not too long ago, the deputy NASA administrator. Uh, uh, although we haven't completed those designs, uh, we're, we're playing around with those concepts and how that might have uh, uh, its appearance uh, in terms of its utility and everything else on Mars. But guess what? The Mark Watney suit, as you see here, it's a beautiful rendition or a combination between the surface suits that we were developing that were functional on the surface and some of the functions that we use in our uh, extravehicular activity suits or EVA suits, we call them, indeed on space station and, of course, uh, 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 on the shuttle and everywhere else that we go into space. So uh, we love the way they, they adopted and adapted some of the thinking that we had uh, from our surface suits, and then also used in the movie, the EVA suits, as they should have uh, for the Hermes scenes. Now, in, a, in addition to that, uh, the control rooms. Uh, we have uh, today two separate control elements. One at Johnson Space Center, as you see in the lower panel. This is where uh, the, the uh, Houston, uh, there it's, it's a Houston, Texas, and so, you know, uh, this is the group that manages the human exploration mission. So everything on space station and prior to that shuttle, et cetera. Uh, these are what the basic control rooms look like. Now, in addition to that, we have a robotic control room. Those control rooms are at JPL. And when we were at JPL, we had an opportunity to show them those control rooms. And, and what Art did in terms of creating uh, the, the set design uh, here it is in the in the background, uh, this beautiful set design, which combines both of those control centers, not only the, the orbiter control centers, but human exploration control centers. And some of these feed outs, actually, uh, uh, rather than have them created, they asked us to do screen captures of real controller uh, systems uh, for which we did and send them to that. So that all they had to do was bring up that, uh, that uh, background control system as you see on many of these consoles, which are real uh, data taking from real missions uh, 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 on many of our vehicles. So once again, wonderful approach in terms of the look and feel about the movie. Now, what I really liked about the book and the movie is the Martian is really a science mission, all right? And here you see Mark Watney early on uh, out in the field, and his job at that time was collecting samples, you know? But in addition to uh, that, we also see the deploying of instruments. These are things that humans can really enable our science by participating in intelligent sample selection, and proper instrument of, uh, emplacement and getting them up and running, uh, drilling in difficult environments, being able to take rock samples that, that tell us about the history of Mars in the right locations based on a geologist's view of the whole scene. And so rapid access to sites, you know, the mobility of humans to be able to be working in one area in, in one part of the day and a completely different area, maybe miles away in, in later on in the day is the ability that humans have for, uh, for a mobility, which we don't really have for our rovers. The furthest our rover has moved 
on the surface of Mars in one day is about 120 meters. And even then it's a constant, it's a constant interaction uh, to make that happen with, uh, with um, uh, the controlling centers. And so there has to be some rapid response to the changing conditions. And of course, one of the top things that we wanna do, particularly in the rock samples are, that we are returning is indeed looking for signs of life, whether it exists there today or uh, perhaps in its past. Now, the movie starts out, of course, with uh, the, the team already on Mars at Ares 3. That's the name of the, uh, the site, uh, their, their uh, home base. And with this huge dust storm that comes up, uh, they have to evacuate, as shown in the clip. Now, this turns out to be the first part of the movie that's not realistic. Uh, we don't have storms like this at all. Now, the book in general and the movie is what we would call hard science. They try uh, to describe science fiction by extrapolating into the future, but do it in a realistic way. Uh, this is the only real part of the movie that's not very realistic, and that's because Mars has a very thin pressure. Its atmospheric pressure is less than 1% of our own. Although the wind can blow as much as 120 miles per hour with such a low pressure, it's not enough to then make a flag uh, blow in the wind and completely see it. You know? And so consequently, uh, uh, I asked Andy Weir why he had such an unrealistic dust storm since everything else he tried so hard to make it realistic. And he said, look, this is a, a human versus a nature uh, movie, you know, it's a, it's, that's where the conflict is at. And I wanted nature to give him the first punch. And indeed, they did uh, with, the, with the loss of um, Mark Watney out of the team that's returning. Now, what do the dust storms really on Mars look like? Now, these are two of the most unusual dust storms that look very foreboding they're on the surface uh, and, and they have some look about them uh, as the previous dust storm, but they don't have anywhere near the power. Uh, it's really much more of obscuring the environment that, you, that you're in. And it turns out, uh, you know, your day turns into night if you're sitting in these dust storms. But the real dust storms gradually occur over time. Now here's some real observations from Opportunity. Uh, you can see in the left-hand panel in the red circle, this dust storm actually is moving in. Uh, and, and indeed what happens is um, uh, it blocks the light. We call that opacity. If the opacity is one, then that means the sunlight is getting through the atmosphere. It's very transparent. And as the opacity number gets higher, then it turns out it, the atmosphere is becoming more and more opaque. And so these are panels over a 30 uh, day or what we call a soul on Mars. One day is a soul and it's about uh, 24 hours and 39 minutes. So it's virtually like our own day. Uh, but uh, these are taken at the same time and they're selected out of this month to show you how overall it just gets darker and darker and darker. It begins the process of looking like sunset and then it gets into what may look like night. And what's obscuring all this is a fine set of dust. And many times this dust can be as high as 20 or 30 kilometers, okay? Now here's an artist's conception to the left. Once again, very unrealistic. And when we look from our orbiters down on Mars, to see these dust storms that uh, you see in the center panel, a dust storm and the dust storm now is passed and we can see uh, a, a lightning strike. This is what the ground would look like after a lightning strike. Uh, and indeed over time, as the dust begins to settle out of the atmosphere, then the lightning strike uh, changes that appear on the ground uh, go away or hidden. Now we know this lightning is occurring not only because we can see the aftermath after a dust storm, but we also can see it from orbit. Uh, 
So here's an example from the Mars Global, Global Surveyor of a big dust storm going on where these little lightning flashes are lighting up certain, uh, certain areas. Now, the importance about lightning is really it's a, a separation of electronic charges, all right? And so dust can be charged uh, and it can get lift, lofted uh, to great heights. Uh, that uh, difference in, in height uh, causes a, a potential difference between that and the ground. And uh, there's, as soon as a pathway is found, you get a little spark. And that's the kind of lightning that goes on on, on Mars is these, is these little flashes, all right? Is these little flashes as they go along. So uh, indeed you saw in the clip uh, some of the lightning that, that, that occurred Occurred, and that was added to the movie after our initial uh, discussion about, about the fact that there is real lightning on Mars. Well, what about the dust accumulation? Okay, so you see, you see Mark Watney at the, uh, at, uh, uh, the end of the dust storm, uh, you know, buried in a pile of dust. And it turns out, yes, dust accumulates in all, all kinds of places on Mars. Here's an image in the bottom panel of curiosity next to a, a very uh, modest uh, dust dune, if you will, that has occurred and in, in finding its way to go through these before it goes up uh, this huge mountain, which is where it's at right now today, uh, continuing on its investigation. And so indeed, that's, that's pretty realistic. It, the dust does indeed and can accumulate, but it doesn't do it all at once. It just does it gradually over time. Now, one of the fabulous things that we found out about Mars was features in the atmosphere that we hadn't seen before and we hadn't anticipated. And these are the dust devils. Now, you can see in the bottom panel, uh, here's Spirit from a camera angle looking down the mast uh, from uh, uh, this little rover. It, it was uh, designed to be powered by solar panels and we see what the dust has done, uh, but if, a, if, if a, a spirit or opportunity, which were both solar power, got into these, these dust devils, that would be cleaned off immediately. It's really fascinating to see the charge on the battery that occurs over time as it begins to dwindle, and then all of a sudden a dust storm comes and it pops right up, fully charged, because it's getting that from uh, the solar panels. Now, we knew the Mars environment was dusty, and this is why we always thought that spirit and opportunity when we land them on the surface of Mars, and then these were like coffee table size rovers uh, that um, uh, worked for many years. Uh, spirit worked for six years, opportunity worked for 14. We thought, well, with the dust settling out, if they worked for 90 days, it'd be a success. My goodness, they just, this atmospheric phenomena, which they ran into often, kept cleaning the panels, really did a wonderful job ensuring that these rovers could continue on working. And indeed, in the movie, the concept of cleaning off the solar panels ha has to be done because this dust is in the atmosphere almost all the time at some level, and then will uh, eventually uh, fall out and, and produce coatings on the solar panels. Now the dust devils can actually get quite high. And uh, you know, this is a, on the left, this is a real image of, of uh, uh, you know, a kilometer or more high dust devil uh, with its beautiful reflection uh, back on the surface. And indeed in the movie, we see these eerie looking scenes of these dust devils in the background. And, and that is indeed very representative of the, the Mars environment. Now, another thing in the habitat uh, that you can see here where everyone is crowded around the screen, uh, which is uh, showing us this weather coming in. You know, how realistic do we do is, is this? And it turns out today we have a global circulation model of Mars. We can predict the climate on Mars in terms of its temperature, its pressure, and its wind velocity everywhere on Mars. 
We are where the Weather Service and NASA and NOAA was probably in the late 60s, early 70s here on Earth in terms of being able to predict the weather on Mars. And so we are really doing quite well. So at the time humans would be on the surface of Mars, these models would be easy to be able to get access to and have them run to see the weather coming in and predict what will happen well into the future. So that, that actually is quite realistic. Now, today we have an array of operating missions. Uh, in fact, uh, 2020 was just a, 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 a fabulous year for several really important missions that, that have gotten to Mars. In fact, we see uh, in orbit uh, everything from Mars Odyssey, Mars Express, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MAVEN, the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, okay, has their own satellite called MOM, and then ESA, the European Space Agency working with Russia, has the Trace Gas Orbiter, in addition to the ESA mission that I've already mentioned, Mars Express. So, uh, and then on the surface, we had curiosity and insight. So up to 2020, we had three space agencies uh, taking data and working together uh, on Mars. Now, 2020, uh, you know, when the planetary window opened up and a series of spacecraft left the Earth and, and, and now are in orbit or on the surface working on Mars, we have the United Arab Emirates mission called HOPE. Uh, we have an orbiter from China, Tianwen, and we also have their lander and rover, which has now been deployed and working on the surface, in addition to uh, the Perseverance rover and our wonderful little helicopter, uh, Ingenuity. Now, in the book, uh, uh, Andy Weir describes this network of satellites in this future era, in the 2030s as uh, NASA having 12 orbiters and ESA having two. Well, in reality, you know, there's now other nations involved, but, but that is really quite good. It's a, it's a great look and think forward. And I am sure over the next several years, we'll have additional assets, uh, not only orbiters, but, uh, but of course, uh, uh, those uh, rovers and other stations on the surface of Mars in this era of collecting more and more information before humans get there. Now, uh, the big Perseverance rover that's there now is making all kinds of spectacular measurements. It's uh, designed to identify regions where we want to core the rock. We want to be able to get a, a, a chalk-sized or a large Crayola crayon sized sample, and put it in a tube, put it on the ground that will then later be picked up and brought back so that we will analyze those rock samples. We will look for the mineralogy, we will look for uh, how or why Mars's climate changed because Mars was a blue planet. It had plenty of water on it in the past. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, two thirds of it was underwater, in some cases more than a mile. Uh, and over time, Mars went through rapid climate change and lost its ocean. And the rock record has to tell us, you know, it has to show in some way why or how that climate change occurred and how fast it occurred. So the samples are really important. Now, in addition to the fabulous set of instruments that are, that are made there, we actually have two technology demonstration instruments. One, indeed, was the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, this helicopter uh, is doing fantastic. It's the first uh, uh, ab ability that, that the world has had to fly in another atmosphere, and it's working spectacular and is scouting out places for perseverance to go to and, and create uh, these samples in the right places. But also uh, next to it in the bottom uh, center part of the screen is an instrument called MOXIE. Now, this is a pretty spectacular instrument. And it, it stands for Mars Oxygen ISRU Experiment. Now, ISRU means in situ resource utilization. Now here's an inside view of MOXIE, okay? It's about, as you can see, uh, a nice sized cube. It's not very huge, but it brings in the Mars atmosphere and 
it, which is carbon dioxide, primarily carbon dioxide, about 95% of Mars's atmosphere is, is, is stuff we can't breathe, all right? It, it's carbon dioxide, and, and it zaps that carbon dioxide, pops an oxygen off. So you have carbon monoxide and oxygen, and then since a free oxygen likes to connect with stuff, uh, that oxygen will connect with other oxygen and will end up with carbon monoxide and O2, which we breathe. That's what we breathe here. So this is the first oxygenator, as the movie would call it, uh, on Mars. And we've already tested it. It's already working well. It's doing exactly what we want it to do. And it's going to work in the morning, afternoon, and evening, and during a full year and give us the efficiency or life cycle of, of how it would work over a day and, and throughout the year that will enable us to size it just right for whatever crew we need to go to Mars that would bring in that oxygen and supplement uh, what, what oxygen we bring with us. This is a game changer in our ability to have a sustainable presence on the surface of Mars. And of course, Andy Weir leveraged that in, in the book and, and uh, certainly uh, had a prominence in the movie. Well, uh, here is what a year on Mars is like. You know, one year on Mars is about uh, 687 Earth days. Okay, so it's about two of our years is one year. And here's how the seasons uh, stack up. So the top, top panel is... Um, is indeed uh, 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 a Mars year. And uh, the bottom panel is our year here on Earth. And the movie is set uh, by having uh, the crew land uh, at Mars on November 7, 2035. It turns out that is a perfect planetary window. And it occurs, of course, just before Thanksgiving. Uh, so that they have a, a, a food uh, to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving dinner. So it's a it's the perfect time. Uh, and and Mark Wa Mark Watney then is the the biologist that will leverage that, and we'll talk about that a little later. But Andy Weir felt that this was just the right the right setting, and he did a perfect job picking that window. Now Watney stays on the surface 549 days, and so when he's trekking down to, um, and I guess I should have said this, a spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie now, um, you know, too bad, tune, tune out, because these are going to be spoiler alerts. <laughs> but indeed, um, he treks from Aries 3 to Aries 4, and it does it during this, the, you know, the dust storm season. And in fact, in the book, uh, dust storms come up, and he has to go around them. Uh, so they hadn't gone completely global. That's very realistic. That indeed, uh, it is uh, what will happen on Mars. So Andy Weir did a wonderful job uh, placing this at the right planetary windows that allow indeed uh, the crew to be at uh, Aries 3 during the, th uh, the thanks uh, Thanksgiving season. And so here's Mark Watney on the surface and, and he's growing his potatoes. And, and of course he says this. In your face, Neil Armstrong. Now, you know, from NASA, when I heard that, I felt, gee, that's almost sacrilegious, right? Now, and I wanted to just point out to Matt Damon and Ridley, you know, uh, you're wrong, Mark Watney. You know, our, our long term person on the surface is really uh, uh, opportunity, and it, it, it lasted. 5,111 days. And in fact, um, uh, it, its end of mission uh, was just a couple of years ago on June 10th. Well, what about Ares 3? This is the camp that they had selected, a site in uh, Asadila Planitia. Now, Planitia means it's a lowland. And this actually is an area where the ancient ocean of Mars would reside. And in the book, this is exactly that coordinate system. And in fact, uh, we have, we can go into our archive and look at the high resolution imaging of this place as seen in the panel uh, on the far left, and then uh, explode that panel so you can see exactly where that Ares 3 uh, base camp is. And then indeed, here's a scene out of the movie where uh, Mark is looking at these crater rims, what would be portrayed in the movie as crater rims, with at the bottom of um, 
uh, of uh, the crater rims you see, you see indeed if you look carefully where his base is called Ares III. Well, this is very realistic. Uh, Ridley and his team uh, scouted the world looking for places they could do this. This turns out to be uh, Jordan. The filming uh, of these desert scenes in Jordan, uh, as if they were on Mars, of course, were, was done in December. So they were filming them during the winter months uh, in, in, in these arid locations and did a fabulous job picking the right spots that connect well with, uh, with this location on the surface of, uh, of Mars. In fact, here's what we call a Mercator projection of Mars. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we make it a, um, a longitude and latitude uh, uh, rectilinear grid. And then we color the altitude of the surface features, red and white being the highs and the blues and the greens being the low areas. And then, and then on top of that, we've placed all the uh, uh, surface assets that landed and worked or have now uh, uh, been turned off or failed uh, after uh, working on the surface for a period of time. And you can see the array of missions that we have done. Now these blue areas, these light blue areas, that's where the water would be. So for ancient Mars as a blue planet, the ancient shoreline is indeed these green areas, you know? And so if we feel that life is moving from ocean here on earth to land, tides are important and the shoreline's important, then indeed uh, uh, the missions that many of these missions are on that ancient shoreline really tells us uh, what's, what may have happened as we go through the process of looking for life. Now, indeed, uh, the next big mission uh, is uh, European Space Agency's ExoMars. They have named it Rosalind Franklin, and uh, it's a fabulous mission. NASA is um, a participant, uh, participant in that mission, and we're really excited about it. It will go in the next opportunity. Uh, so that, uh, that's another year or so from now. So where is Ares 3? Well, Ares 3 is shown here. Uh, just a little to the left of center, and, and, and you can see it's above where Viking is uh, and Pathfinder is in Opportunity, okay? But that's still an enormous distance. It's not really close uh, because this is really a big planet. The surface area on Mars it equals about the land surface area of the Earth. And so if you subtract the oceans and put all the continents together, that's about the same surface area as, uh, as shown here on Mars. Now, what about the, the structures, the features, the soils? What, what do we have on Mars that is most like the film? Well, indeed, with uh, curiosity here, in Gale Crater, it's boring uh, into the surface, powdering it. And in fact, this is one of the, the first hole, first two holes that we did. Uh, this really shocked the scientists because it's gray Mars. It, it's not this red patina everywhere, which is we now know is only a thin layer on the surface. But below, we have some really great soils. And so as we brought them into our experiments and have tasted them, we find that uh, their carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, actually everything we, we, we have in our bodies, those fundamental uh, materials, those chemicals for life, we also find the soils are moist. So there's a significant amount of water that's, not, that's, that's been trapped in the crust that has not left the planet, uh, which is wonderful because that means the soils are moist and there's nitrates, okay? And nitrates are a wonderful fertilizer. So that is a really good start uh, on, on allowing the fertilizer in these soils to be used for growing crops. Now, this information wasn't available uh, when uh, Mark Watney wrote his book and, and made some projections of uh, what would happen uh, on Mars in terms of growing food, but indeed, we now know that there's all the essential uh, plant nutrients, both macronutrients and micronutrients. And conceptually, we will be starting out with important greenhouse capabilities 
uh, as we uh, uh, begin to live on the surface of Mars for longer periods of time, uh, we have the ability to grow foods. And so in the movie, of course, and in the book, it was all about uh, the Thanksgiving dinner, the potatoes that were sent, uh, Mark using those in terms of planting. And there are some toxins in the soils. They're called perchlorates. We have found those. They're not everywhere, though. You know, Curiosity has been in an area where they, they have occurred, uh, have measured them, we know a lot about them, but has also moved into other areas where there's no perchlorates at all. So it seems to be um, uh, only, only on the surface, it's not permeating the soils and can easily be scraped away or leached out uh, before you actually uh, use the soil. So indeed he, he brought uh, the soil into the habitat uh, one of the uh, uh, elements of it uh, in one of these large rooms, and then uh, converted that into his own special uh, garden. Now, the soils at Curiosity are alkaline, you know, and so that would be good for beans and asparagus. Uh, and, but we're also assuming elsewhere on Mars there would be more acidic soils, uh, so, that, so that would also uh, be important for uh, growing potatoes. Uh, we don't know what the soil uh, uh, pH is in the areas where Aries 3 is, but once again, this is also pretty realistic. We believe that he'd be able to indeed uh, uh, grow, uh, grow potatoes on, on Mars. Now, in addition to that, uh, I, I was remiss in interact. I'll, I'll, I'll take credit for this, I guess. I was remiss by not telling Ridley and his team what a sunset would look like, all right? The atmosphere is so thin, the blue light, which is scattered in the atmosphere, actually is not scattered so much that um, uh, it, it, it turns these blue skies uh, all, uh, uh, all the way down to sunset and sunrise on Mars. So the, the sunset and sunrise on Mars is all blue skies. Where here on Earth, you know, you, you have red sunsets and, and of course, uh, red um, uh, 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 early morning, uh, you know, dawn uh, conditions. And so that's what was used uh, indeed in the movie. Could have been better in, in that respect, but really uh, a spectacular set of, of um, scenes that were done at, at, in, in the evening settings. Now, once again, what about this long distance driving? Now the, the vehicles that we have uh, uh, have the ability to go hundreds of kilometers. And so indeed the movie has their own vehicles uh, and it's gonna trek around uh, very far on Mars, not only going to uh, where Pathfinder is, but indeed go from Aries three to Aries four. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this indeed is the vehicle uh, and it's, out in the open and therefore it has to go through uh, the temperature cycle of Mars. So what do we see on Mars? Well, the temperature here is uh, one, one basic day on Mars and you can see the cycle. So at noon, the temperature and pressure goes up, uh, but in the evenings it goes down at just, you know, like it is here on earth with that, uh, with that cycle. Uh, but the difference in temperature from the highest to the lowest can be 170 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Uh, or, or indeed uh, 85 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. So it's huge, a huge change in temperature and rightly so. You know, the concern about uh, Mark Watney freezing in the vehicle was, uh, was well done in the movie. And indeed they, uh, they went and found what, what uh, was called this radio isotope system, this radio uh, isotope thermal generator. Uh, and then Mark Watney uses that in, in the cabin, as you can see in the upper right, uh, uh, wraps it up and then uh, brings it into the cabin. Well, these are also very realistic. The, we use radioisotope uh, thermal generators. They generate not only power, but a lot of heat. And that heat is used to keep the instruments and experiments warm as our rovers and landers on the surface suffer this huge temperature range, this huge temperature cycle, as we talked about. 
Uh, and so indeed the, the look and feel of that uh, in the movie was great, although uh, we would never have buried it. Uh, we wouldn't have buried it because indeed uh, that would uh, uh, take the moisture in the soils, which is frozen and create water elements and, uh, uh, and therefore maybe an environment where uh, if we brought uh, our own life, our own bacteria, and is sitting on these radioisotope power systems, we would literally have bring a life colony to Mars. So we would never bury it. You know, there's what we call planetary protection. We try to really uh, uh, keep everything clean. So we're not bringing a lot of life uh, to, uh, to, uh, to any of the planets, Mars in particular, and study it in as pristine a state as we possibly can. Now, uh, as uh, the movie portrays, Mark Watney uh, makes a track, uh, you know, from Aries 3, as you see on the right, all the way down to Pathfinder. And uh, uh, he takes off and makes that. <clears throat> now, our rovers have the ability to go to 100 to 200 kilometers in, in, in distance. And uh, that's how they're designed. We call that an exploration zone. But in this track, just to get uh, uh, go down and get Pathfinder, Indeed, uh, that is a that that's a huge trek, uh, but of course in the movie he's able to do that and brings back a very realistic looking uh, pathfinder, uh, which is the which is the platform that the Sojourner rover rode on, and then those two were landed, and then the Sojourner rover rolled off uh, the pathfinder platform made measurements in and around. And of course, he also brings the little rover. It's about the size of a microwave. And you see that in, in the movie. Uh, you see that in the movie too, running around as he's gotten that up and running. So what about these exploration zones? Well, NASA is planning to have uh, an area, once again, between 100 and 200 kilometers in size, we call it an exploration zone. We'll land in one por portion of it will have a human habitat in another portion. We have regions that we're uh, looking at where we'll do a variety of fabulous science. And then there'll be resources we want. There may be ground ice, there may be uh, uh, trapped um, uh, mineral minerals, water in these minerals that we can extract. Uh, there could be uh, many other metals and things that we will want to get access to. And so we will do uh, what we call ISRU, not only of the air, but indeed of uh, the environment around us to be able to bring that in and use it in 3D printers. Uh, now, 3D printers at the time weren't uh, a, a really big uh, portion of, uh, of technology in use at the time Andy Weir wrote the book. But they're going to play a critical role in the future because we're able to manufacture parts. We're able to then take things with us that then if they break, we can repair them by using the materials that are on Mars itself. Now, uh, in the end of the movie, of course, uh, uh, unlike NASA, there, uh, the movie plans to have, and the book does, a series of, of landing sites, all right? So here's Ares 3, and then the Ares 4 landing site is a significant dis a distance away, more than 3,000 kilometers in distance away. And uh, in reading the book, you can actually plot the route. And here it is, it's plotted here. And I've verified that with Andy Weir. This is exactly the route that he was thinking of, too. Uh, and indeed, uh, as you can see, right after you leave uh, Asadia Planitia, you end up going into an ancient river valley that pours into that ancient ocean. And of course, one of the scenes uh, is indeed, you know, uh, inquiring it back at uh, uh, here on Earth. Well, where is the rover? And you see the rover, and it looks like indeed it's rolling through an area that it's a, a an ancient river valley. Well, you know, they did a really tremendous job picking these scenes that match the book very well, and making them very realistic from a uh, from a Mars perspective. Well, where, are, where is NASA at in terms of picking these ARIES sites? 
Well, we've already had our first workshop several uh, years ago uh, where, we, where we had um, an open forum of discussion. We have more than uh, 50 sites or, uh, that were discussed. Several uh, now have been dropped off. So we have about 45 sites. And indeed, these are sites that could be candidate places for humans to, uh, to go and be our first exploration zones. Uh, and, and we'll whittle this down over the next several years. Now, also, how much do we know about Mars? Well, if you had a scale here on the bottom where we didn't know anything about the surface of Mars to the far uh, right-hand scale where we have everything that we need for humans to, to go there and live and work, we're really getting pretty close of, of having what we need uh, to really allow us the knowledge necessary for humans to go to Mars and live and work. And so in the meantime, all our orbiters and landers are continuing to make great progress. We'll have several more in this next decade. And so as we get into the 30s, just like the book says, we then have potential opportunities for humans to then uh, go to Mars and, and begin that new phase of exploration on the surface of Mars with humans. So uh, with that, let me um, uh, stop and um, uh, stop sharing my screen, and then I'll go to uh, questions you may have. Thank you very much. All right, so let me go to the question and answer area. Okay, the illustration of the surface suit is modeled on a female. Are you making space suits and surface suits for females? If so, uh, are they going to have this decoration, which uh, looks great on the illustration, but might not look great on many women? Well, uh, yes, uh, what you saw on, on Deva Newman was uh, the design that she had created. Uh, uh, we will indeed have a very diverse workforce and, and uh, uh, those suits are under development now in terms of discussing at a very early stage, what do they need to contain? You know, what do they need to look like? So we have a lot to do in that particular area. Okay, another question is, um, you talk about the distance the rovers can travel in a day. Does ingenuity change that? Ah, okay, so what does ingenuity the helicopter do? Well, it actually is scouting out regions, one, that we hadn't planned the rover to move to, but as it scouts out, may uncover some really exciting things that we should explore. So in reality, what Ingenuity do, is doing is providing us data to then make better decisions about the, the local route that the rover will take. Uh, and so uh, that's how it's currently being used. Now, it wasn't intended to be used that way, but it's serving that purpose right now. It was only intended to just fly a couple times, make sure it works so that we understand what it's like to operate a rover uh, on the uh, surface of Mars. All right. Does the dust particle size have an influence on whether or not you get a lightning strike? Um, uh, I'm not sure of that. It may. Uh, the size will change based on the fact that there's also humidity in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, some of these start out like talcum powder, okay, and, and, and there are processes for which they, they can grow a little bit, plus uh, water may hang around them. Uh, that also, that also en enables uh, the, the dust to uh, maintain its charge. Okay, another one is uh, moon dust was a real problem, got everywhere. Yeah, it sure did. On Mars, the dust is oxidized and potentially toxic. And that's true too, and will need to be eliminated from the habitats. What consideration uh, has been given to this chore? Indeed, uh, the dust on the moon is different than the dust on Mars. If you look uh, in, in a microscope of the dust on the moon, it's very spiky. It's because it's not generated in an atmosphere where, where it blows this dust around and then rounds out the spikes. And so consequently, the problem with the dust on the moon is being able to breathe it in and get it into your lungs because it will tear up your alveoli. So, so it's very important. Now, there are a couple techniques for which uh, 
since we know sometimes this dust gets charged, you can then scrape the dust off through an electrostatic mechanism, a sweep of uh, pulling the dust off because of the nature of the charge. So some of those things are being discussed and, and um, uh, actually tried. Uh, how frequently did the rovers get stuck uh, or, or struck by dust devils? Hours, days, weeks? Ah, so that's a really good question in that it, uh, uh, we couldn't predict it. We couldn't predict it. Uh, it, would, it, it wasn't as periodic. Uh, fortunately, both spirit and opportunity are in areas where we have dust devils. However, perseverance, it hasn't seen a dust devil yet at all, nor uh, did, um, uh, uh, we might have seen one or two on curiosity, but they are very rare in those areas, but they're not needed because both perseverance and curiosity uses radioisotope power. All right, is the Martian weather prediction more accurate than the Earth's weather prediction? No. We're far from being able to do like what we do here on Earth. Uh, we're several decades away from, uh, from where we were uh, uh, for, uh, of predicting Earth climate on Mars, but we're rapidly making uh, major changes. In fact, we've just now implemented how the dust moves, how it can be cr created, uh, whether it will go global or not, and, and now we can predict sort of where the dust is. That was a big problem that we had for some time and that research now is, is really uh, paying off. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, one of the most significant Hollywood errors is the effect of sound in space. The absence of sound in vacuum would, uh, would be uh, way too boring. Yeah, you're right. Okay, how did the movie's depiction of sound on the Mars environment compare to uh, uh, real data? Good question, because we've just been able to implement uh, some record, sound recorders on Mars where uh, after we've landed and roved and, and, and shot the laser, we've recorded the sound. Now, sound is gonna travel differently on Mars because of the environment, the low pressure and temperature. Uh, and, and so it favors long sound wavelengths. That means it favors deep tones, okay? And, and so uh, you don't hear the high pitch, you'll hear, you'll hear things in bass, so to speak. Uh, that's, that's turned up on Mars. Uh, that wasn't done in the movie, uh, you know, uh, uh, relative to the movie for me, um, I, I, I love science fiction movies. Uh, I you know, get my popcorn and check my science at the door and go on in and just enjoy it. Uh, you know, I, uh, other than what we've done here, talking about what's real and, and what the movie was done, I thoroughly enjoyed The Martian, uh, even with the flaws of having music or sound in unrealistic uh, settings. All right, what about the level of radiation on Mars? Does this make life on Mars difficult or dangerous? Yeah, another great question. We know a lot about the radiation on Mars. Now in the book and also in the movie that was totally ignored, uh, but I have to tell you, we have a much better handle on it now because we've launched a radiation detector on uh, Curiosity. So Curiosity had it all the way through the solar wind uh, and then all the way through the landing, and then all the way uh, as it's moving in and around on the surface, making those measurements it needs to. And we can take those measurements and convert it into total doses that an astronaut would feel. And it turns out uh, if we launched uh, an astronaut on the same time of the solar cycle uh, and experienced the same things that Curiosity did, then it increases our cancer level from about 3%, which is what it is on space station, probability of getting cancer uh, well into the future after you return, if you live and work on space station is about 3%. Uh, but for the Mars mission, it's gonna increase it to about five. Now I can guarantee you, if I walked into a room of astronauts and I, I, I would say, I'm looking for the first volunteers to go to Mars. Uh, here's the downside. It's gonna increase your probability of getting cancer from in later in your life when you return from three to 5%, how many wanna go? Every hand in that room would go up. I can just guarantee you. <laughs> so right now 
We don't think it's a showstopper, although we are concerned about it. There are times when it can be quite, quite intense and we need to develop capabilities for alerts to then have uh, in shelter places for the astronaut to go and be protected, okay? Uh, you mentioned the term planetary window a couple of times. What do we mean by that? Yes, indeed, a planetary window is when we can launch from Earth and we can go to our target in the minimum amount of time without running around in the, in the solar system uh, for years trying to chase down a planet. This is when all the planets line up on the same side of the sun, enabling us then to make that trek and fly from the Earth uh, indeed to the planet. How these trajectories go, as soon as you leave the gravitational influence of the sun, your, or Earth rather, you're orbiting the sun. And so your trajectory has got to be in an orbit that takes you past the place you wanna go. In other words, past the orbit of Mars, and so as your spacecraft moves to the location where Mars is at, when Mars is there, you're landing, you know? And we call that a ballistic trajectory. We, we you know, we fire our, our, our rocket from Earth and go right to a place on Mars's orbit where Mars is at exactly at that time. And that's not all the time. That has to be done very precisely. And so we call that a planetary window. Okay, after the initial tours and discussions, how much ongoing contact was there with the film producers? Yeah, uh, actually quite a bit. So after that initial contact, uh, I would get a series of questions uh, from uh, Ridley staff, uh, uh, quite a once, once or so a week, sometimes a, a big one every other week for several months. And I would look through them and I'd say, okay, I'm gonna answer these. But then these, I'm gonna, uh, you know, have an expert, uh, you know, and I would reach down in the organization and send those questions to experts. And then I'd put the, the answers back together and send them uh, back to Ridley and his team. So, uh, uh, so we started with the tours in June. And after the tours, we got questions June, July, August, and starting even in September. But by the end of September, no more questions. They were off filming. They were off and running. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we're, there are opportunities for us to correct mistakes. So uh, uh, that one's kind of interesting because the first time I, I, I met Art and his, in, 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 in his team and uh, had read the book and the script by that time, I made 26 suggestions. Okay. But by then, they had already decided they were following the book to the best of their ability. So although they took several suggestions, lightning was one. Another one was to use the more modern surface suits. Uh, the third one was indeed uh, you can uh, manage that radioisotope power system from the radiation it produces by wrapping it and cutting down on some of the radiation, which is exactly what they did in the movie. So. Um, uh, out of the 26 suggestions, I took three of them, <laughs> which I thought was, you know, based on where they were, they were really quite far along. Okay, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? All right, so our Artemis program is really all about going to the moon this decade. You know, by the end of the year, we'll be launching our first major capability called the Space Launch System that can take us to the moon, okay? It won't, be, uh, won't have any humans in it. It'll be a test. And then uh, we'll do it again with humans. We'll do a figure eight around the moon and come back. And then we'll go for the landing in the third shot. But so that's coming up. You know, we're just a, a handful of years away before that happens. That's important because we're gonna learn to live on a planetary surface. We're gonna try a number of things out on the moon that we do on, on Mars. So by the end of this decade, we may have humans on the moon for maybe five events and they won't be there for a day or two. They may be there for several weeks, okay? And that's the current plan. Uh, that means then in the 30s, we actually have our first opportunity to go to Mars. And certainly by the 40s, uh, we'll have learned enough to be able to send humans to the surface of Mars for the first time. All right, what, ha uh, what happens 
uh, to the rovers uh, that are no longer operating. Well, they're turned off or they die and we can't resuscitate them. Uh, uh, we're not going to go get them. There's no point to doing that. You know, the, the, the movie did it, which was great. Okay. But there's no point in us doing that because we'll develop the next set of tools we want on the surface and we may not put them in the same spot. In fact, as you've seen, there's quite a distribution across the planet. We need that because not every place here on Earth is the same. And that's certainly the case on Mars too. And so we need to really understand uh, as much about Mars globally as possible, which means we need, to, we need to continue building rovers and landers and put them in different spots. We're not gonna be able to revive the old stuff. You have to remember once they die the, and they no longer are heated on the inside, the temperature variation is so great, it will destroy circuitry, you know, pop capacitors, you know, uh, you know, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, uh, some electronics just don't survive in these I I extremes of weather, particularly cold. Okay, what is a reasonable target here for humans to reach Mars? Well, they come in windows and the windows are every 26 months, okay? So like every two years, and indeed um, uh, the concept that Mark, uh, of Mark Watney and his team going in 34 is a legitimate window. So you can think of 34 and then 36, 38, 40, you know, so there's, 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 uh, there's four or five in that decade as opportunities. What's the typical size of a dust devil? Diameter, okay. So, they can be a fairly, fairly large, 15, 20 feet in diameter, or they can be smaller than that. Uh, I think everything we've imaged has been at least uh, eight feet in diameter. You know, so these are, these, are, these are pretty, pretty hefty. Now we actually have seen from orbit, you know, where they've also cleaned the dust on the surface, where underneath the dust might have a slightly different color and therefore we can see the track of these dust devils, okay? Not everywhere, but in some places. Some of those Im images are really fascinating to look at. Are there any other science fiction novels that are similarly science fictionally accurate like The Martian? Uh, I, can only, I can tell you from a personal perspective, it's not like NASA's endorsing the next set of, uh, of things, but, but indeed, uh, Andy Weir is sticking with the theme of, um, uh, of hard science. He's sticking with the theme of, of, of knowing uh, the technologies and the activities we're doing today and then, and then creating events and activities uh, into, well into the future. Uh, his, he's got uh, two books out, uh, Beyond the Martian. One is called um, uh, Ar the, uh, Artemis and the other one is called uh, Hail Mary. I recommend those. Uh, but I also like other science fiction. I mean, like Dune, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that is really exciting, uh, you know, completely other world. Now, when you think about it, we're, we're discovering exoplanets all over the place. We have found m more than 4,500 exoplanets with all kinds of different environments. You know, whereas, whereas uh, uh, 25 years ago, we had no idea we'd ever find a planet around another star besides our sun. Okay, and uh, and now we now now it's just a new era, and so that opens up a lot of imaginative stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm really coming down to the end here. Uh, let me just take a couple more questions. I'm sorry I can't get to everything. Uh, will there be geology or chemistry based positions in NASA in, or in the space agencies? Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, uh, we're working hard with the, the American Chemical Society uh, to at every one of their uh, uh, conventions uh, to have a NASA day where we come and talk about the chemistry on Mars or the moon, uh, uh, some of the things that we need to do, uh, even um, uh, pharmaceuticals. I mean, when you think about what humans need, you know, they need all sorts of different things to support life in a sustainable way. And that, that includes medicines. And so how do, we, how do we take what we need to then enable an astronaut who may get sick to have the appropriate medicines they need? You know, there's so many things that we need to do in that area and we're doing research in that as, we, as, uh, as, you, as I've stated. 
All right, when the first crew mission is sent to Mars, what would that mission involve and how long would that mission last? All right, we are actually discussing that in earnest, all right? Uh, there's a little difference of opinion, but the key to the first mission will be finding a location where we think there's resources that can be used, particularly frozen water, okay? Uh, and then how long would the mission last? Well, the mission uh, uh, can last, uh, we have two basic choices, okay, based on these planetary windows. We can go and live and work on the surface for about 30 days and then return before that window closes. Okay, so it's about 180 days. There, there, you're there 30 days, but it's about 200 or 220 days to return. Uh, that's the trek. Okay. And Andy Weir used the short stay in his book. That's called the short stay. The long stay is we land and we spend more than a year, okay? Uh, but that's a, a, a Earth year. So that's, a, a, you know, 390 days or so. And then the window opens up and we can return. So 180 days there, 390 days on the surface or 400, and then another 180 days back. That's the long stay. And that connects to, uh, that connects to um, uh, the windows that I talked about. Okay. How realistic was the rocket to Mars and the entire setup to uh, Mars and return to Earth? Very realistic. Okay. Now, NASA has not done yet like what Arthur C. Clarke uh, envisioned and what Andy uh, Weir envisioned as was represented in the movie to have a spinning wheel to create artificial gravity. We're just now thinking about how to do some art artificial gravity experiments on space station. But that's an option. We may, we may be using artificial gravity to go there. The problem with artificial gravity is it's very hard to keep a spacecraft moving uh, in, in the exact trajectory we need when there are potential tugs and pulls going on in this big wheel that's spinning around. Now, in the first versions that I saw, the wheel was too small, and, and we iterated on that, and, and, and they created a larger wheel for the artificial gravity. Uh, but I thought they did a really realistic job of that. Now, they used what were called ion engines, the ability for uh, the, the Hermes to speed up, use a gravity-assisted Earth, and then go back to the planet. And we are implementing ion engines right now on a whole bunch of missions. We did it uh, for several missions in the past. Uh, we're we're going to be launching a mission called Psyche next year. That will have an ion engine. And so uh, these are these, this is like, uh, you know, um, uh, what Star Trek had um, their lowest uh, power. I forgot what the name of the, uh, you know, impulse, their impulse engines. OK, that that would be the analogy. And indeed, we have them. OK, that that works. And so uh, let me let me take uh, the last question. I've got to take this one. Uh, what is your vision for potentially making Mars more livable? or livable limits on terraforming Mars. All right, so indeed, there's a lot of work in discussing how uh, humans can live on, on the surface. As soon as that happens, changes in the atmosphere will occur. Uh, but are there other things? Can we, can we grow plants and then change the atmosphere? Yes. Uh, what would be the process of doing that? We don't know, but we're trying to figure it out. How can we mitigate some of the radiation? Well, several people are doing research, including Ruth, uh, that just asked this question about developing magnetic fields that provide a bubble uh, for Mars to then fend off the, the solar wind. And what happens there, instead of the solar wind stripping the atmosphere, the planet will continue to outgas and the pressure will go up. So the concepts of terraforming Mars are indeed being explored today. Uh, they're explored in the research that we do. They're done in supercomputers. They're done, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, uh, really creative ideas in mind. And that's the start of any research topic as we then whittle down what are the best solutions and then start performing experiments in space. That's a little way off, but right now uh, we indeed are studying them. 
Okay, with that, I'm so sorry I can't answer um, uh, many more. Uh, uh, let's, let's leave it at that, but I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to come and talk about NASA, NASA's activities, and one of my favorite planets, the planet Mars. Dr. Green, Jim, that was absolutely wonderful, as we knew it would be. Um, my name is Carol Sutra. I have the great pleasure of being the master of St. Cross College here in Oxford. You can see some of our architecture reflected in the sunlight behind me. Okay. Um, it's, it's a tremendous delight to us to be able to put on this series of um, talks uh, for the Centre for the History and Philosophy of Physics, uh, run by Dr. Joe Ashbourne and facilitated by the Department of Physics here. And Helen Smith has been stalwart in making everything work for us. I hope you could tell from the enormous number of questions yes. and the range of questions, just how much people loved your talk. Um, quite a lot of things came up on a number of occasions, things like the radiation, things like how long it will take for us to get people there. And you just took everything um, straight on the chin and, and answered it. And I think from, from the audience point of view, the excitement of knowing just how accurate so much of that film was yeah. and how you were able to influence it um, was, was really exciting because all science fiction buffs love to see the excitement and the blasts off and the um, technical things that are going on. But it's always a bit unclear whether there's any realism to it or not. And I think you've reassured us that actually there was a tremendous amount of realism to it. Um, I particularly like the question about sound on Mars because one of our own fellows, Dr. Neil Bowles, is part of the team that helped capture the first Mars quake sound. So um, it, Mars is pretty close to our, to our academic heart here as well. So... Mm -hmm. um, it's really an enormous pleasure on behalf of all of us to thank you yet again for giving us your time. Um, right. We have recorded the, uh, the talk and it will be available uh, in a few days time on our website. So anyone who wanted to go back and just check some of the details, it will be up and available in a little while. Um, it's been a fantastic evening here in, in Oxford, at least. The sun is pouring down on this Friday evening <laughs> and it's really wonderful that people have, uh, have joined us and have stayed with us but they really had a great deal to listen to and enjoy. Well, so Jim, great. thank you so much. Uh, Joe and Helen, thank you for your organization and support as always. Um, and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you Bye. so much. And may you see a blue sunset sometime. <laughs>